guys, welcome back. Uh, here we're sped up four times. Um, so I'm going to try and speak in a really soothing way to offset the crazy speed that you're seeing in the video. Uh, these sculpts typically take, well, it really varies. You know, the Frazetta sculpt with it being a two figure sculpt, it seemed like it took forever. Um, the Ruben sculpt was about a day. No, normally I would, I would say about a day for these, for these kinds of sculpts. Um, with Sheila, it took slightly less time just because, uh, just because of the nature of the work. There's less precision needed. Um, no, that's not the right way of putting it actually. Because I think one thing that I learned from Sheila was like there are some things that are crazy precise. But, um, but of course, like the looser your style is, the more that you're going to be able to get away with. This no, that's still not the right way of putting it, because, um, yeah, because I think my takeaway from this, you know, we'll we'll talk about it more in the. In the post mortem, but um, I'm not really well, well. Sheila's not really getting away with anything. Like everything is quite uh, conscious and quite deliberate, and even the stuff that I think wouldn't be conscious, because uh, you know when we're analysing work like this, we have to be aware that um, all the the decisions that we look into and break down uh, won't necessarily be conscious decisions by the artist. I think that's that's really important. You know. Something like the golden ratio, for example, in, in composition, you see recurring uh, time and time again. And yet, I think very rarely would that be conscious because because if it were, then um, then the process of creating composition would just be tedious. You know, you have to be measuring everything out. And so I think like when you pursue uh, what the ideas of design with enough clarity of intention, you will see certain things recurring. Anyway, let's um, talk a little bit about what's going on on the screen through here. So. Um, so really this is at the stage where I'm saying that this idea of having prepared a canvas that we've spoken about before. So now I would say canvas is prepared. So now I just revisit everything um, and not, not to bring it closer to a finish, but to bring it closer to what it is that I want to say about it, right? So every time I'm re revisiting it, yes, hopefully I get closer to, to the finish, but the finish is kind of dictated by um, has it captured the full character? So for example, on the lips, you know, am I getting that strength of like him pushing the lips out, you know, or with the hands, the, the hands, well, of course they're always going to kill you because they're so complex. Um, but what I found was that every time I return to them, I'm going, wow, okay, I've got to kind of make them more simple and more blocky if I'm being stylistically, stylistically consistent with, with what Sheila's doing. And yet at the same time, I need to make them more accurate, like, like the, just the, the lines that he has where the fingers join and stuff like that, it's not just a wobbly line. It's perfectly indicative of the rhythm of the joints and how those joints sit together when the hand is closed. It was actually <laughs> only that only through doing this this particular sculpt and observing that, you know, that that um, just going, wow, okay, that's really sophisticated how how just the fingers feel like they fit together perfectly just through the, the way he's handled those lines. And, you know, so then to depict it in, in my own sculpt, I was having to observe it with, let's say, similar sort of uh, vigor. And, uh, and then I realized that, yeah, well, I guess the reason why each of the finger joints are in a different place, like, you know, the, the middle finger being the longest and the other ones being slightly shorter, is potentially for that reason, so that you can close your your fingers together and where your joints flare out won't be all in the same place so then they can kind of fit together more snugly um, maybe that seems really obvious now that i now that i say it but it just sort of um resonated with me through through this and i, I feel like you know okay maybe for you guys it is obvious and you know lucky for you I'm, I'm happy for you but um but it's through doing studies like this that you know and and i guess also through like consciously engaging constantly thinking about what it is that that you're doing that um you know you you come across these little things that maybe seem obvious but you hadn't thought about before and then become part of your library and become something that you can then take with you you know forever and, and they may influence you in ways that that you hadn't thought about well as i was saying that stuff um if you were paying attention to the screen at the same time which you should have been um you'll you'll have seen me just go over to the other, to the other hand and um, I really, you know, with the other hand, it was it was great because I could do whatever I wanted and find that meeting point between my work and, and Sheila's work, and and you know, I wanted to keep this idea of this sense of like um, 
his vertical and horizontal um, placements of the body, you know, this, these kind of very uh, almost architectural compositions. So, um, so I kind of kept that hand pointing out. Actually, what I, what I did, not, it's not part of the demonstration, but I'll, look at, I'll go over it in the post-mortem. Because after, after doing the demonstration, I then took those fingers and really extended them just to get this feeling of, um, you know, because it's a very forced pose, right? So I just wanted to work with that and put in more tension and things like that. Also, you can see that little finger is just, um, well, it's not, not a great view here, but you can see that little finger is just jumping out, right? So the three fingers, the um, index finger, the middle finger, and the ring finger are all bound together, and the little finger just breaks away. And, um, and I don't know, I just... Uh, I don't know if he would have agreed. I felt that was kind of like a Sheila sort of way of playing with it. Like you have this, um, these strong rigid constraints and then you just have that form that little bit of looseness. And as I was sculpting the little, the, the little finger, I was looking to just really capture that and see, see how much, how much life I could force into it. Yeah, putting on the, the eyebrows, I, I just pretty much left them like that, to be honest. You know, that's the nice thing about not being constrained to to uh, realism or photorealism. So you can just um, make marks and, and you use the marks to tell the stories without being constrained to what is real. So as I'm blocking in all of these forms, I'm first and foremost, well, I don't know first and foremost, but my instinct is always to be like, where is the form coming from? Where is it going to? So in a minute, you'll see me working on the biceps and I'm just going, yeah, it comes from the corrugal process and then it goes to the radius. And that allows me to, to like, let's say geographically place it. And then I'm thinking, okay, what is the visual language that I want to use? And that's where I'm taking from Sheila and going, how would he depict the biceps? And well, actually that's an area that I'm going to look at in the post-mortem because it's a really good example of an area where um, his muscle is, is placed accurately but then he's taking the personality of the muscle and just uh, what taking a, a ton of steroids and you know like like not pumping up the muscle but pumping up the character of the muscle and just really dialing that up as as far as it'll go um, and we see that pretty much everywhere I think you know one big takeaway from this uh, uh, this this module this exploration of, of Sheila's work is just like it's just how surprising anatomical it was you know how surprisingly sophisticated it was. Um, now, as I'm as I'm here hitting the lips, I'm just you know looking for the big movements, hitting those borders or the big stories, right? So the as the lips get pushed together, we looked at this a little bit in the um, in the facial expression module. Um, as the lips get pushed together in a sort of pucker shape, uh, the hard border of the lips is going to maintain, and the middle section is going to is going to squash. As I'm looking at the nose, I'm just really making sure that I'm getting the angularity of those uh, of the nostrils. You know, it's He's really he's using the nostrils as like um, as a, as a movement that reinforces the line of the eyebrows, right? Just to really pump in this uh, like ferocity to the to the expression. Again, that's not something that I think he would have aimed to do intentionally. Like, oh, yeah, it's a clever idea if I look at the nostril and, and match that line with the line of the brow or anything like that. I think it's just you know when you when you really ingrained in these ideas of design you'll find them you'll find they start to manifest themselves um you know subconsciously let's say now as i'm blocking in the nails here uh what what i think is quite interesting about the way that sheila handles fingers is just how how he squares them off at the ends and how blocky he makes the fingers themselves um whilst keeping them tapering right and, and those are two things that i would say look regardless of um the stylistic approach you're taking, just observe the fingers. They're blocky because they're bone and they taper at the ends, but they also flatten off at the ends. And if you look at generally how fingers are depicted in a stylized way, if you look at, um, you know, Disney, Pixar, DreamWorks, uh, conceptions of, of hands and fingers, you'll often see the same thing. They taper towards the end, but they're blocky at the end. And one challenge for me in, in doing this sculpt was, a, a, especially with the hands i think when i took that idea and kind of ran with it it started to look like cartoony fingers and that was an interesting balance to to try and hit here and, and you guys will have the same thing if you're if you're doing similar studies is to go okay how do you how do you go for that simplicity um and yet not have it feel cartoony that's that's the balancing act you could look at it from the other point of view as well and go okay how do you 
make something that's anatomically descriptive and yet doesn't feel like it's like it's overcooked for this style right for this style of work and when you're thinking about things in those terms you're essentially thinking about what is the visual language that you're defining and um and again like i've mentioned this before but i think if we were doing if we were sculpting anatomy lessons from master sculptors then the temptation would be just to copy whereas when you're working from uh, to your reference then it's kind of you have to go okay how do i interpret that uh into a visual language that works in in three dimensions and you know i will talk more in the uh in the post-mortem about my my interpretations and, and the way that i the way that i worked with sheila's style and tried to interpret it but um and try to to straddle that line between um between what like uh anatomically defined details and what to lose and what to you know what to um exaggerate and have stylized one way that you could look at it is in terms of how sheila is using it is like this if something's bone grab hold of it you know like you, we can see here the shoulder girdle is just a massive bone if you go to the elbow joint there uh, he's really flaring out the humerus um, and, and enlarging the olecranon on of the ulna so you can just feel those three bony points really really strongly the rib cage each one of the bones is depicted you know even though it's just a line he's still finding it there so if it's bone grab hold of it and if it's muscle what is the character and personality of that muscle and then you can take that and really push that so for example something like that we looked at in the analysis of the biceps having that little dip in the middle um, to break the what like the sweetness of that curve it's just taking that and cranking it up and then opposing that with the movement of the triceps and look it's something like finding something like that on the biceps that doesn't happen by accident right you find that through very careful study of anatomy and or very careful study of the model but this approach of going okay let's find let's find the bones to the maximum extent that we can with the maximum uh, let's say descriptive or intention to describe them as possible and then let's string the muscles across them and find the characteristic of the muscles as much as we can that's that's what using anatomy in your work is the fact that Sheila is doing it different to how Raphael was doing it different to how Frizetta was doing it and different to how Rubens who we'll look at in the next module does it is indicative of them being different personalities and artists that occupy different eras so the cultural zeitgeist is going to be different so the things that they're looking for is going to be different but ultimately it's still coming down to the same thing right because you're still depicting the human body and there's a thousand ways to do that but a sensible approach is to go find the bones and then find the description of the muscles that are strung across the bones